After we have characterized the set of all this counted arbitrage free prices, let us now come to a couple of examples. So the first example is the following. I would like to consider a financial market model as bar consisting of one risk-free security and one risky security. I would like to assume that this financial market model is arbitrage-free. And moreover, I suppose that the numerator, so this component as not t, is, is increasing in time and starts at 1. So here's an example of that. For instance, you can choose uh, as not of t simply to be deterministic and given by the value 1 plus r to the t for some r um, greater um, than uh, minus 1. However, I do not uh, impose the condition that as not of t has to be deterministic. It could also be a random increasing um, stochastic process, which should be adapted, of course, uh, and which starts at 1. And uh, moreover, I would like to consider now a European Union call and put option. Uh, with strike price K and with maturity capital T. And by the previous theorem, we know that both the set of all uh, discounted arbitrage free prices for this um, um, European call and for the European put are non empty. In particular, we also know that there exists uh, a measure Q in the set of all equivalent Martingale measures with the additional property that the expected value of um, the uh, discounted uh, European call option under this measure Q is finite. So, and then it holds true uh, that this expected value, which I would like to denote by pi of um, uh, C core, is nothing else but the expected value of uh, the difference between the discounted price process X1T uh, and uh, the ratio between the strike price K and the value of the numerator at uh, maturity and then takes the positive part and you see the function which maps x to the positive part of x is a convex function meaning if we uh, apply Jensen inequality we get a lower bound namely the expected value of the um, discounted price process minus the value of the strike price divided by the numerator at maturity and then taking the positive part of that. And uh, you see that by using linearity and uh, the fact that, uh, and this tower property of the condition expectation, um, I can simply rewrite uh, the first sum as the expectation of the condition expectation of x1 capital T given f not of t uh, minus the expected value under q of the ratio between the strike price and the value of the numerator at maturity. But since q is a martingale measure, we know that this condition expectation over here is equal to the value x1 um, uh, one at the initial time point zero. And since we assume that um, the numerator at the initial time point is equal to one, this coincides um, with the value of the risky security at time point zero. And again, using the property that um, F not is trivial, it follows that this random variable um, um, of the S1 at time point zero is um, uh, P almost truly constant. And since Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P, it also follows that that random variable over here is Q almost truly constant. Hence, 
I can take out here um, the value as uh, 1 at time point 0 from that expected value and I obtain that the price of the call option is bounded um, from below by the positive part um, of the difference between the price of the risky security as its initial time point minus the expected value of uh, the strike price divided by the numeraire at maturity but now using uh, or taking advantage of the fact that we assumed that the numeraire is an increasing process uh, we get a lower bound by replacing um, s not t by the value s not not which is equal to one and in that way we obtain as a lower bound the positive part between the initial value of s1 and the strike press k and this value over here would like to denote as the intrinsic value so this shows clearly that the uh, price of a european call option is bounded from below by the intrinsic value so can we do a similar computation also for the price of the put option and well um, to some extent yes so we can also use Jensen because also the function k minus um, x positive part is a, a convex function uh, so the only difference is that we cannot take advantage of the of this fact that um, the numeraire is increasing so this goes unfortunately in the wrong direction so we end up simply by the estimate that the price of the put option is bounded from below by the expected value under this equivalent Martin game measure q of the ratio between k and s naught of t minus uh, the value of the risky security at uh, its initial value and you see um, in order to get rid of that uh, uh, bit over here uh, this can only be true if this numeraire is either decreasing or since we assumed it's increasing it can also only be constant so and here I have shown to you um, two caricatures of the possible uh, call and put price as a function of the initial value. So you see here that the value of the intrinsic process with respect to this uh, call option. And we have seen that the price of the um, European call option is larger than the intrinsic value and actually it turns out um, that it's uh, to some extent strictly larger for uh, uh, some non-trivial interval and the difference between the um, price of the uh, European call option, option and the intrinsic value it's called also called time value in this particular case this time value is always known uh, negative. On the other hand, uh, the behavior of the price of the put option is slightly different. You see, we cannot conclude uh, at, in the last step um, that uh, the intrinsic value is a lower bound for the price of the put option uh, without assuming that the numerator is constant in time. And this has the following effect that at the beginning as the price of the put option is below the value of the um, uh, intrinsic um, uh, value meaning that the time value which is again the difference between the price and the intrinsic value is negative and then there's the turning point and um, for higher values of the price of the uh, risky security as uh, it's uh, well, 
at its initial time point, the time value becomes non-negative. So let us add here a remark. So whenever you have a financial uh, market model which is arbitrage free and which starts um, at time so um, such that the numerator starts at time point zero in in one, and you have uh, European contingent claim C, then a value P larger than zero is not an arbitrage price of C if and only if either P is less than pi for any pi taken from the set of all um, discounted um, arbitrage with prices or this value p is strictly larger than pi for all pi taken from the set of all discounted arbitrage with prices. So let us now come to an Another example, namely, I would like to address again the call put parity um, for European call and put options. So for that, I consider a uh, financial market model consisting simply of um, one um, risk-free security and de-risky securities. I would like to assume that this financial market model is uh, is uh, arbitrage free and moreover I would like to assume that the numerator is an increasing function and that um, the ice component of our um, uh, price process is a non-negative p almost truly for all time points. So and then I need to know by c call and c put the European call option of the ICE component and the European put option of the ICE component respectively. And here I again choose um, K as the strike price and capital T as maturity. So, and then the following holds true. So by theorem 219, we know that there exists an equivalent Martingale measure uh, Q such that uh, the expected value of the discounted European call option under this measure Q is finite um, and um, that also the discounted, va uh, discounted value of the put option under this measure Q is finite. So why is that possible that we ensure the integrability of these both random variables well here comes into the picture that we have chosen um, this numerator to be an increasing function and that the value of the ice component of our uh, risky security is non-negative because that allows us um, simply if we write down what that is namely that's nothing else but as a strike price divided by the um, numerator at maturity minus the discounted price of the ice component at maturity and under that assumption over here that component or that uh, uh, term is non-negative so by dropping it we get an upper bound and by taking then advantage of the fact that the numerator is in the increasing function we get a further upper bound by simply replacing that value by um, the um, value at time point zero and clearly um, under our standing assumption that the sigma algebra at time zero is trivial meaning that the process at time point zero is p almost truly constant we see here that this ratio is p almost truly uh, finite and this immediately shows that once we uh, have chosen q in such a way that that expected value is finite this um, follows trivially because that random variable is bounded hence we can now consider the uh, price of the discounted call option minus the price of the discounted put option which is nothing else 
but the expected value under this measure q of the difference between the positive part of xit minus k divided by s not t and the positive part of uh, the strike price divided by the value of the numerator at maturity minus the discounted uh, price of the ice component at time point t, a uh, capital T. Here's a typo. Um, so what does that mean? Simply we now have to distinguish two cases. Suppose um, xi of t is larger than that value. In this particular situation, you can simply drop from here the positive part. And on the other hand, in that particular sit uh, situation, that uh, part over here is zero. Now, let us assume that the value of xi t is less than or equal than that value. Then this first part is uh, uh, zero, whereas the second part you can uh, get rid of the positive part and then taking the minus sign inside you immediately end up in both situations by the following expression namely the expected value of the ice component of the discounted price process at maturity minus the strike price divided by the numerator um, and now let us again write um, this expected value um, in terms of uh, the expected value of the conditional expectation of uh, the dis ice component of the discounted price process at maturity given the sigma algebra f naught and since q is a martingale measure we know that this conditional expectation over here is equal to the value of the ice component of the discounted price process at the initial time point, namely x, uh, at the time point zero. And um, again, taking advantage of the fact that the sigma algebra is not as trivial, we end up with the following expression, namely that's nothing else but x i naught minus uh, the expected value um, of the ratio between the strike price and the value of the numerator at maturity. So, and in the particular situation, when the numerator is deterministic and the initial value of the numerator is equal to 1, so an example is that uh, the numerator at time point t is given simply by 1 plus r to the power t for any r larger than minus 1, it immediately follows that um, so we can get rid of the expected value at that point because that's now a deterministic process, we can take that out. So, and um, moreover, we can also rewrite the discounted price process in terms of the price process since the initial value of the numerator is equal to one. And then we end up with the desired call put parity, namely that the price of the call option plus uh, k divided by uh, S not capital T, so that's so to say the um, um, value of our zero coupon bond is equal to the uh, value of the, the price of the put option plus the initial value of our um, ice component of the uh, price process at its initial value. Okay, let us now come to the following theorem, uh, which tells you an if and only a relation uh, between attainable um, contingent claims and uh, the set of all um, discounted uh, arbitrage-free prices. So for that, I consider again a d plus one dimensional arbitrary financial market model denoted by S bar and defined on our favorite probability space omega FFTP. I consider an European contingent claim which should be not identically equal to zero. And then the following holds true that this European contingent claim is attainable 
if and only if um, the upper bound pi inf of this discounted contingent claim equals uh, uh, so the, sorry the lower bound pi inf of the discounted contingent claim equals to the upper bound of the and uh, discounted contingent claim meaning that in that particular situation the set of all discounted arbitrage rate prices consists only of one single value. Again, I would like to uh, present to you the proof only under the additional assumption that the sigma algebra f is finitely generated. And you will see why we will use that in a moment. So let us first prove the first direction. So if C is attainable, well, this question we all also have addressed. Well, that's namely the statement of this corollary 2.20, where we concluded that the price is uniquely determined, meaning that the upper and lower bound has to coincide, meaning that the set of all discounted um, uh, arbitrage prices is single value. So for the opposite direction, let us assume that uh, the contingent claim is not attainable. So this simply means that for any self-financing trading strategy H, the discounted value process at maturity is different uh, from the uh, value of the discounted contingent claim. Again, let us consider uh, the set K, which consists of uh, the following, namely the stochastic integral between a predictable process and our discounted price process. And we add to that um, discrete stochastic integral, which is nothing else but an F capital T measure of a random variable, a real number A. And um, this set already appeared in the proof of um, the second uh, fundamental theorem of asset prices 2.16. And there we have uh, convinced ourselves that under the assumption that F is finitely generated, the set K is a linear subspace of all FT measurable real valued random variables. And moreover, that uh, set K is isomorphic, or the that subset of uh, in, uh, um, isomorphic, so is a subset of that set of all FT measurable random variables, and the later set is isomorphic to the uh, set R n for some uh, capital N. And in particular, we know by that observation over here, since we can rewrite that also in terms of the, this counted value process at maturity that this, um, in, uh, this uh, random variable is not contained in that set k. Okay. So now let us uh, take into account the assumption that our price process is uh, arbitrage free by using again the first fundamental theorem of asset prices we know that the set of all equivalent martingale measures is non-empty hence for any q1 chosen from the set of all equivalent martingale measures there exists a non-zero bounded f capital t measurable random variable y and that such that y is taken from that set k and the um, random variable that is orthogonal um, to this uh, set k with respect to the scalar product defined uh, in terms of this measure q1 meaning in l2 and Due to the fact that the sigma algebra f is finitely generated, we know that both random variables are contained uh, in any LP space. And moreover, we would like to choose y and z in such a way that we can write 
the discount contingent claim C divided by S0 capital T in terms of the sum between Y and Z. Meaning we simply obtain Y and Z by orthogonal projection of Z element onto the space K in its orthogonal complement defined in this weighted L2 space L2Q1. Now let us consider uh, or define another measure Q2 on this, uh, or this measurable space omega f uh, in the following way. Q2 of A is simply uh, the expected value with respect to Q1 of the indicator function of A times um, density phi, where phi is given by 1 plus z divided by 2 times the supremum's norm of z. And as in the proof of uh, the second uh, fundamental theorem of asset prices, uh, we uh, know that um, uh, this measure Q2 is a probability measure. We also know that Q2 is um, a, um, uh, is an equivalent martingale measure, meaning that Q2 is also equivalent to Q1. And we have also shown there that the expected value um, of this random variable y which is an element from K under this measure Q1 coincides with the expected value of Y under this measure Q. And in that computation, we simply took advantage of the fact that the expectation of um, V under this measure Q1 is equal to zero because uh, also the, the random variable constant equal to one is contained in that set K. Additionally, we also have that uh, the expected value of the random variable z with respect to this measure q2, which is nothing else but the expected value of uh, z times phi under this measure q1, where phi is that density here, nothing else but the rather Nicodemian derivative uh, dq2 by dq1 can be explicitly computed, namely if we plug in that form over here, we see that there's nothing else but the expected value of z under this measure q1 uh, plus uh, the, um, um, the um, expected value uh, of um, z squared divided by 2 times the supremum's norm of this random variable z. And since that term over here is uh, strictly positive, we know that we can bound that uh, sum over here strictly from below by the value, expected value of um, z with respect to this measure q1. So here's a type what should be q1. And uh, moreover, we know that that value over here is equal to zero by that construction. Hence, uh, we obtain the following. Namely, the um, lower bound uh, pi inf of this discounted um, contingent claim is clearly bounded uh, from above by any expected value um, uh, under, this, under any equivalent Martigier measure Q1 of the discounted European contingent claim. Now let us uh, take advantage of the representation we have over here. So we write that random variable in terms of the random variables uh, y and that. So then we take advantage of the fact that um, um, the expected value of uh, y under this measure q1 uh, is equal to the expected value of y under this measure q2. And on the other hand, by that computation, we have seen 
that um, the expected value of uh, Q1 is strictly less than the expected value of Q2. So provided or correct here the, the typo. But then I can rewrite again um, uh, this expected value under Q2 of the sum of Y and Z in terms of this random variable um, uh, C divided by S not capital T. And clearly the upper bound uh, pi sub uh, is then an upper bound for Z expected value. And this clearly shows that the lower bound is strictly less than the upper bound. However, we assume that these two bounds are the same. And this leads to a contradiction, meaning that uh, this um, contingent claim should be attainable.